thank you so much for being here. Hi. Hi. <laughs> Congratulations wow. on the show. Thank you. Uh, people love this book. It's an incredible book. And it's been adapted a couple times, but it's never been adapted really into a series. No. Were you aware of the book when you were asked to be a part of the show? Uh, by that point, I was. But when I went in to read for it, I had only read the pilot. Oh, wow. And I didn't know... I didn't know that it was this book that had been published in 86, and I didn't... I didn't know really who Serena Joy was, and um, and I certainly didn't know that it would be so accidentally aligned with today's current state of the world, current politics. The Handmaid's Tale, a.k.a. Mike Pence's America, into <laughs> a series, his fantasy America where he gets to call every woman mother. Mm, mm. <laughs> Did you like that? <laughs> So you get the pilot. What's interesting about the pilot to me is that it leaves a lot out in regards to what is actually happening in this sort of dystopic future. And these things, this, these pieces of the story build as the series goes on, right? So, what, so were you kind of confused getting the pilot? Did you understand everything that was happening? No, I didn't, which is what, was, uh, what, what drew me to it also is that there was a huge mystery. Uh, and I, I sort of had to put the pieces together going in. You know, what the, Serena Joy, who is this woman, why is she so unfriendly? Uh, <laughs> to say the least. To say the least. Um, but then... You know, and and that was you know as I got into it more, and as I and, and then when I got cast to Serena Joy, suddenly I start reading this you know amazing novel by the amazing Margaret Atwood, and uh, and then I and I realize I maybe got myself into some deep water here because I don't relate to Serena Joy much. Good, good. She, <laughs> it's good. It's it was that that was a huge challenge to make sense of this woman who uh, is is very mean and brittle and not someone who you want to be your friend and um and and here I am trying to make sense of of this bad guy because I'm I feel like I'm playing one of the bad guys and uh and how how do I humanize her what what is the heart of this woman why is she so mean uh, How do you make her not one-dimensional for you, the actress, so you don't feel like you're going in and sort of playing the same thing every day or not really finding the core of her? Well, I mean, that's like a whole can of worms. I mean, I feel like she is... To me, when I when I broke it down and when I got down to the nitty-gritty of it, I really thought that Serena Joy is, is someone who has been stripped of her... a huge part of her identity. Here's a woman who, in... in present-day America, which is now in our story, the Republic of Gilead. Um, she, she was a smart woman. She was an intellectual woman. She was a writer. She was a spokeswoman. And, and here she is now in Gilead, not able to work, not able to read, because women are not allowed to read in, in Gilead. Um, they have to, women are supposed to follow their biological destinies, which is to provide children and care for the home, and that's it. So here's a woman who's been stripped of all of that stuff, and also stripped of her connection to her husband. So I can I imagine pre-Gilead, her and the commander, played by Joseph Fiennes, might have had somewhat of a normal relationship. They're, they're people of faith, and, and within that, they had a connection. They related to each other intellectually through their work. Uh, he's obviously a smart man. They're related to each other sexually also. So then you take away a woman's right to sexually relate to her husband. And what are you left with? I mean, I think everyone can ask themselves that question it does, it's not a great place to be in at all. It's very lonely. And so much of the time when I was playing Serena, I, I felt like a lot of it was about connection and trying to find a connection in a world where you're not allowed to connect, or you can't connect in the way that you used to. And add on top of that, the fact that Serena Joy was part of the architects of creating this society that she lives in because of her faith and because of what she believes in. At some point, I feel like she did fall off that conversation because women are not allowed to be part of that conversation anymore, but she was one of the people that fought to make the society the way it is. So it's like, it's so complicated. Well, it's an odd duality that yeah. she, the, she's in, in the sense that, yeah, she sort of was the architecture, but the architect behind this world, or one of them, and now that she's living in it, all of her rights have been taken away. It's the sort right. of chickens coming home to roost for someone who's very far <laughs> on the right, who's sort of are planning a world like this. Yeah. Is that sort of what you kind of came up with as well? That like, yes, this was by design for her, but now that she's living in her design, she, it's also humiliating and depressing and without emotion. It's all kinds of things. And there's no outlet. 
and that's the, there's so much of this show, I, I think, as you watch all these characters, um, you know, through... Her outlet, it seems, is getting to debase other women. Right. But also, and because I'm biased because I have to play her, she's also trying to survive. And I feel like the one beacon of hope that she holds onto is the fact that she can maybe have a child one day. And because she's been deemed a barren woman, she can't have a child. She has to rely on Offred to give her this child. And she will get that child at whatever means, whatever it takes, at Offred's expense. And that's where we get into all this amazing brutality in the show and and the, the, I mean, there's a whole world of brutality in this show, but that's definitely part of it. And you see this crazy power play between these two women who also, by the way, in the book, it's a, it's a little different because Serena Joy in, in the original book is older. So you don't, and now that Lizzie and I, uh, Lizzie Moss, who plays Alfred, are of equal age, basically, it's... Um, the power play is so interesting because you have, here you have two women. One is at the top of the food chain and one is at the bottom. But yet that power play is not so black and white in reality. And, and so often, you know, when we were playing and doing the scenes, it was so great to have all these things that we never thought would pop up, pop up. You know, all the different nuances of the power play and the energy and and her power over Serena in the ceremony scene where we where we where we all have sex together. No, that's not how it goes. My husband has sex with her. Scene. It wasn't, I didn't <laughs> see that scene. <laughs> it's complicated. <laughs> what episode is that scene? I didn't, I missed that one. Hey. I'm gonna have to rewind. That's in, that's in, that's incredible. Now, a lot of people attri- say that this book, this book which came out, uh, Margaret Atwood's book, which came out in like 86, 87, was incredibly 86, yeah. prescient in terms of the sort of the the right wing and and how much further to the right that they got and how much more misogynistic that it that it's become, and especially now. I know you guys were shooting this during the election, right? So what was that like to go from what everyone thought was going to be the first female president to the first president that bragged about sexually assaulting a woman? I don't think it's funny. Sorry. Yeah, it's... Um, totally fucked up. <laughs> I, it, that was really... Mm, that's, that's, that was really tough. I personally, well, here's like a little bit about me with that because this is how I'm going to explain the rest of it. I never, I grew up in Australia. Our politics are different and I'm not politically minded and I was never really interested in in it. But it's hard to turn away when something like, you know, the Trump-Hillary campaign is going on. So I got super drawn into it, of course, and... um, and I was surprised. I surprised. I, I surprised myself in how emotionally involved I got, and how much it affected me emotionally when she lost and he won. And suddenly, uh, I found myself playing a character that, in a lot of ways, um, she's she's a bit Trump. You know, there's a, that hierarchy in in this uh, Republic of Gilead is. Is 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 that? And I and I found myself, you know, seeing all these parallels. But at the same time, I found myself seeing all these parallels um, with the issues that were being brought up with with women. You know, women's rights to their bodies. Uh, what rights do we have when we get pregnant? You know, all, all the all that kind of stuff. And and so there's also a duality going on there. Um, and 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 suddenly we're we're making a show that <laughs> feels a hell of a lot more relevant than it ever could have been and that's one of the uh, to me that's just so amazing that here we are ma- making a show about a, a novel that was written in 86 and when we're here and it's 2017 and somehow so accidentally we're so much more relevant than we ever thought we we would be or could be that that to me is it's like it's magic I mean I don't think anyone could have planned for that um I mean, aside from the fact that the show is wonderful and amazing and, and completely, um, you know, beautifully brutal, if, if I can say that, and it'll, it's enticing in its own right, but at the same time, you've got this other thing going on in, in our real world today. It, it's, it's very hard not to uh, acknowledge that. And, yeah. Being from Australia, are you surprised at the sort of uh, right of, a, of American politics? Because... Australia is a Western democracy. I won't get too deep into it. But at the same time, 
their far right wing politicians in Australia are far more liberal <laughs> than the far right politicians that we have in the United States. I mean, they believe in healthcare and in Australia, and they believe in sort of basic principles that sort of help foster a society up. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's different. You know, it, we never, I never grew up with uh, problems with healthcare. You know, we had a healthcare system. I went to university. Uh, my, I had a, a high, you know, university school debt that wasn't going to drag me down the way I see it dragging people, people getting dragged down by it here. I mean, I've, I've got friends who, I can't believe, like it's, it's, it's almost like a system that's set up to, you can't get ahead. There's no way these people can get ahead, and um, and I, I don't understand that that some that how can it be a, a choice for someone you know pay my rent or or pay my medical bill and get treated for this thing that I have to get treated for that's insane to me. But also the the um, how entwined politics is with religion and and, and that's very dangerous. Um, I find but a lot of this what and the this <laughs> is about a lot of what this is about, you know, when we get into that fundamentalist regime uh, and and what that creates and how that affects everybody, um, and you know, in their psyche, emotionally, what it does to humanity. Had you played a villain before? Was this your first villain? I mean, if we can call her a villain, for for lack of a better word, right now. I. Hannah was kind of a villain, yeah. I'm so biased, though. I can't, like, she... Hannah, Hannah. I loved Hannah. <laughs> but Hannah was a sociopath. She was a sociopath. Uh, I guess she was... Yeah, she was... So you've she got was, some experience with sociopaths. I guess. I guess I do. Do you enjoy playing a sociopath? I feel like it's a, it's, it's, it's a lot of fun to chew on a sociopath. <laughs> I guess. But, it, but for me, it's not... It's not... I mean, it, it, from, I think from the outside looking in, it seems like like that, like it, it would be fun to do it from, from that way around. But for me, I'm, I'm doing, I always try and do it from the inside out. So I always try and figure out why, well, it's always why, 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 why is this person doing this? Why, somehow it has to be logically justifiable in my brain um, for me to move through it. And uh, how difficult is it for an actor to do something, to perform something, when you can't logically justify it. And a director or a writer, like, they won't logically justify it for you either. You know, I know a lot of times with actors, they're like, well, why is my character doing this? And sometimes directors are just like, I don't know, that's just what we wrote. And that's what that's what we have to do to service the plot right now. I mean, a lo you know, sometimes, I mean, I, I like to think that I hope I have it sort of worked out, even if I, I don't um, relate to it, that, that, that there is somewhat of a, um, logic for me but but a lot of the time also you take a leap of faith and you know we, we the first three episodes of the handmaid's tale uh reed morano directed the first yeah. three and she's great i had never worked with reed and she is unbelievable really like we we, we really got a chance to play with her and, and there were a lot of moments where you know i, I found myself sort of playing with uh with something that I, I didn't anticipate that I that, that I might explore on the day, uh, and and that is a lot of thanks to her allowing us the time to really experiment and settle, and find the right tone I I think for this show and the pilot and everything that they they'd written everything that Bruce Miller our creator writer put in for this and everything that Lizzie. Uh, ha has done and how how brilliant she has been and and the rest of the cast like it, it really allowed us the time to marinate in and, and be very thoughtful about what we were doing uh, and I think it has paid off I mean so far it, people are responding to the pilot yeah it's great it's something people want want to see um, it's getting incredible reviews I read a review just before we started talking from the Washington Post that said it's you know must see television and it, now more than ever, people need to watch a show like this. That must be an incredible feeling. It is. <laughs> it's, it is, and it's scary, and it's daunting, but it's thrilling. Um, and it, it's just, I, I'm sort of the most excited to see how people respond to this just based on the parallels of reality and non-reality. <laughs> I mean... Possible realities Possible to reality, come. Potential reality. Uh, you are in The Predator. 
the new Predator film, yes. right? That uh, Shane Black, who did wrote Lethal Weapon, wrote and directed The Nice Guys, Kiss Kiss Bang Bang, uh, is writing and directing. A lot of people are incredibly excited for this movie. I love the first Predator movie. And I... It's so weird to talk about the Predator and Shane Black after the Handmaid's Tale. <laughs> right, it's so weird. Change Super the macho <laughs> sci-fi movie. Uh, what was it like working on that movie? Are you still shooting it? I'm not. Oh, okay. uh, it was a lot of fun. I've worked with Shane Black before, uh, so he's a lot of fun. Um, I'm, I'm really, this is kind of boring because I'm not really allowed to talk about or to say what my role is or anything like that, but, um, but, a great cast. It was it was a great cast, and it was so much fun working on it. Um, Shane's got a particular style, and a, sometimes it's a little bit go with the flow, and and it's super fun, and it keeps things spontaneous and go fun. with the flow. Meaning, like people are improvising and stuff, because he's an incredible writer. I mean, I know he loved. He's very uh, attached to his incredible lines and wit within in the script. Mm -hmm. Yes, but th I, mean, I mean, we there is a little bit of freedom, I think, to improvise a bit here and there did you guys have the invisible predator on so like what was going on with the, <laughs> did you guys have like a seven foot guy playing the predator i mean if I, I can't talk about it <laughs> were you a fan of the predator beforehand had you seen it i had i have now but i <laughs> i've been saying get to the chopper my whole life yeah. and i had never seen <laughs> the movie you, you know which schwarzenegger movie that was from no no of course I, I knew but i'd never seen it so i did watch it recently and i and then i watched the other one the Adrian With Danny Brody. Glover. Oh, the Adrian. I haven't seen the Adrian Brody one. Yeah. Um, and the Danny Glover and the Schwarzenegger. Oh, okay. No, I haven't. Yeah. The Danny Glover one's okay. It takes place in L. A. Oh, really? Yeah. I have to. The Predator running around L. A. Go back and do more research. <laughs> go check it out. <laughs> Let's get some questions from uh, you guys in the audience. Who's got a question? Right here. Hi. Hi. I'm a big fan. Loved Chuck. Um, <laughs> yes. I'm not the only one. <laughs> Uh, your character, Serena, um, you guys have said multiple times, is kind of the villain. You are obviously not. But um, So how did you uh, find a way to connect with that character? Was there anything that you um, had to do specifically? Did you, you know, kind of humanize her, you were saying? Um, how'd you do that? I mean, like I was saying, it was it, a lot of it was so much um, a thought process really and just sort of sitting with her and and sitting with the book and sitting with the scripts and trying to figure out um wh why she turned out the way she is I mean you, you know like I said when I think that's a huge big deal when when you're stripped of certain things and you get certain certain rights taken away from you you know um, I mean if you ask yourself uh, you know I don't know what you do for a living or what you like to do but like pick your favorite hobby and and what you do for a living and take that away from you um, and and take away a portion of your relationship to your favorite person, and then you. I mean, how how do you live beyond that? So for me, it was a lot of just sort of imagining what how that might affect different people, and different people might turn out different. You know, at, at some people um, maybe for some people it, it would make them uh, more uh, n nicer or. I don't know, more harmonious as a, as a person on the inside, but I, but for Serena, I, it just was sort of this demise down into this deep, dark hole, um, coupled with this need to have this child. And that, and that really was, is her only shining light, I feel like. I don't see any other shining light for her in this society. And It's the only thing that she can have responsibility over. It's the only thing that she yeah. can sort of, not... I don't want to use control in a negative way, but the only thing that she can actually connect yeah. with and hold on to and, 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 and be a part of because this world that she advocated for took everything away from her. Right. And then and the innocence of a child also and how she can, and also in a, in a non-negative way, manipulate that to her benefit also, I mean, both negatively and positively in this, in the society that she's gotten herself into. Created, helped create. Created, yeah. Yeah, and then gotten herself into. Yeah. Uh, next question. Who's got a microphone? Hello. Hi, how Hi. are we doing today? Pleasure having you here today, by the way. Thanks. So my question is, I know you were involved with the Mass Effect game series. I wanted to ask how your experience was voicing the game, and did the experience seem easier than traditional acting, or was the voice acting easier? Is it easier or difficult? Oh, voice acting is so different because you're, you don't, 
you're not there with anybody. It's just you in a in a sound recording booth studio thing, and there's a big window like this, um, and there's a couple people on the other side of it with the buttons and stuff, and you're just there uh, reading your lines into a microphone. Sometimes they give you a picture or two to look at, but more often than not, you're 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 just sort of uh, making it up as you go. Um, like alone in a booth, and you're like, don't do it. <laughs> Get out of there, Mark. Commander, <laughs> don't leave. Um, yeah, it's, it's all a lot of that. And you play video games? No. Yeah, neither do I. <laughs> <laughs> I played Sonic the Hedgehog when I was... That's the last time that I... On a Sega when I was a kid. Those I'm Sega sorry. Mega Drives. Sega? <laughs> oh, how do you say it? Oh, Sega. Sega. Oregano, that was oregano. Like the most adorable thing that you just flew through Sega. <laughs> Sega, we say Sega in Australia. Tomato, tomato. I knew I had to do it Come there, on. but it was really great. It was really great. Uh, next question. I think it's our last one. Hello, Yvonne. My name is Yvette, and I just have a question Hello, about. Oh, Yvonne, Yvette. <laughs> <laughs> And my question is, I know that the original author of the story is still living, uh, Margaret Atwood. And since the story, even though it is relevant today, not as extreme as the, the story, but since she is still living, did she have any input on the series or the script? And uh, if so, uh, what was it? Yeah, uh, she definitely had an input. I know that she's seen a few of the episodes. Uh, and I think she tweeted out that she really liked it. <laughs> um, but no, she was definitely a consultant for Bruce Miller, who was uh, who was our creator. And uh, the, at the level of, of how involved she was, I'm not sure. That would probably be a, a better question for Bruce Miller to answer and, and Lizzie. Um, but yeah, she's she's into it <laughs> for sure. Yvonne, I gotta let you go. The Handmaid's Tale comes out next week on Hulu, right? It starts streaming. Yeah. And the Predator. When do we get to see the Predator? I don't know. You don't know. Yvonne, thank you so much for being here. Yay. Thank you. <laughs> thank you.